Greetings, class. In previous weeks, I've discussed the history of computers, where they came from, and how they work today. Now I want to talk about the history of the Internet and where it came from. In 1945, the United States introduced the world to nuclear war when it dropped atomic weapons on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were obliterated. And Fairly quickly after that, U.S. military strategists n predicted that they wouldn't be able to keep the nuclear genie in the bottle. Other countries would, in time, develop nuclear weapons. The way nuclear weapons were delivered to their target was by bombers. So, as early as 1948, the U.S. military conceives of the idea of building a radar network, a series of radar towers like the one in the image you're looking at right now in the middle of the ocean or on land that could detect incoming bombers. The challenge was to be able to make that information from radar towers intelligible to base stations. This is an example of a control room for the SAGE system, one of these early radar networks that the United States built. The computers in the back of the room process the information that comes in um, so these men in the military can interpret the radar data that's coming in. Here's an early map of what the system would look like. That tower we saw in the photograph is here. Information from an incoming bomber gets sent to a direction center. Other bombers may be tracked by radar towers on land. All of this information from all of these different stations could all be sent to a central processing unit where workers would be able to look at the the landscape. They'd be able to see what bombers were traveling and what places and what directions and they'd be able to predict a response. They'd be able to send jets to shoot them down. Here's what a control room looked like. It's worth pointing out on this map. Philadelphia is here, Delaware Bay, this is Long Island of New York, all the way up to Boston. Basically the East Coast is displayed in this window. These are those radar tracking windows you may have seen. And this is what the computers of the era look like. Large cabinets. Not long after this system was built, nearly everything changed. In October 1957, the Soviet Union put the first object that human beings had ever built into space. This is a model of Sputnik, the first satellite, the first Thing orbiting our planet made by human beings. Although it was a scientific instrument, the military, the U.S. military, immediately realized that an object like this would make it possible to defeat this radar system. Nuclear weapons could be delivered from space instead of from um, bombers that had to fly across the face of the Earth and could be tracked for hours. This meant a huge advantage in nuclear war. If someone controlled space, they'd be able to almost instantly destroy any target by dropping bombs from space. So, the president at the time approved the creation of ARPA, the Advanced Research Project. The Advanced Research Project was a way of taking military money and spending it on science. The idea was Soviet science had shocked the world by putting an object into space, something human beings had dreamed of ever since they looked up at the stars. And the United States felt that they needed to catch up. They needed to be spending serious resources on, a, on addressing the changing technological landscape of the space age. So the men pictured here are some of the founders of what is going to become the internet. It's worth noting, however, that scientists have different priorities than the military. Many of these men were had ideas for how to tackle the problems of the new age um, that weren't necessarily about um, strategic advantages, but were about improving the kind of work that they could do. All of them knew that computers were going to be an essential tool for doing the kind of work that they did, whether it was in linguistics or 
um, whether it was rocketry to get things into space. And at the time, computers were like those large rooms we saw in early photos. They were so expensive to build. They were so huge, and it was difficult to get access to them. It was difficult for people to be able to um, get some time on the computer. So one of the first things the advanced research project set up was ARPANET. And ARPANET was a way of connecting computers so that a computer in one location could be used by someone in a completely different location. Some of that computing power could be spread out. Here we see some diagrams of early computer networks from around the world that spun off quite quickly after ARPANET was built. Um, we can see Spain and France. We can see Brazil, another image of France. These are all just diagrams that show off the way computers could be connected. We'll discuss a little bit more in another lesson about the way these connections work, but you should know that it's at this moment in history, after Sputnik is in space, that scientists are working on the problem of getting computers to be able to share resources. But some scientists are also realizing that computers at this point are too... they're just too difficult to work with. It's possible to learn the kinds of commands you type in. This is an example of a kind of screen you might have seen on a computer terminal. Um, text is listed, commands are typed, you enter the command and the computer works, but it took a specialized knowledge. It took a long time to learn how to type these kinds of commands. So a man named Douglas Engelbart invented the mouse. The mouse is um, a way of interacting with a computer in a graphical way. He creates one of the first graphical user interfaces. Um, the mouse is designed to work with it. And the idea is instead of just um, typing in a command, you could use a device like a mouse to click or touch, to reach out and literally touch the computer and ask it to do something by pressing a button. There were other solutions to the problem of how do you touch the computer. Here in 1969 at Brown University, you see this woman working with um, a pen that could touch the computer screen and tell the computer to do a command without her having to type it in. Um, this, this concept of using mice to interact with a computer took off. By the 80s, when Apple was starting to make some of the first cheap and popular home personal computers that are much smaller and much less expensive, but almost as powerful as those large computer rooms we had seen in previous decades, these mice really made it possible for humans to interact with a computer. This is why it's going to be important for you to play with a mouse, to get used to actually reaching out and touching the computer. For students who are watching this video in the Moodle course, I'll provide a link towards a presentation by Dr. Engelbart of his discoveries, of, of, of his new inventions from, um, from the 60s. You'll be able to watch an original presentation, it's really fascinating, where he lays out much of the, of the way that we're going to begin to interact with computers. But in a following lesson, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the internet works, how some of the discoveries these people that we've seen made and the way they implemented them so that computers today can communicate across great distances very powerfully. Thank you, and we'll see you soon.